Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, webinar tonight from Wu University about prescribing for binocular vision disorders with Dr. Brenda Montecalvo. Thank you so much for being here tonight, Dr. Montecalvo. Really excited. Um, next slide. I'm your host, Dr. Elise Kramer. Next slide. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Brenda Montecalva, OD, FCOVD, FAAO, FCSO. She is an optometrist and sought after international lecturer who is passionate about the areas of strabismus and amblyopia, vision and learning and neurooptometric rehabilitation, NOR. Dr. Montecalvo's goal is to reach the world with message that vision is precious and it is more than 2020 eyesight. She believes that vision therapy optometrists are the key to helping people have the best possible vision. She is the author of Visual Secrets for School Success, co-author of the AOA Brain Injury Manual, and presents seminar on NOR, optometric vision therapy, and program management. Dr. Montecalvo is president-elect of the College of Syntonic Optometry, past chair of the AOA Vision Rehabilitation Section, and is an AOA Infancy Committee member. She is past president of the Ohio Optometric Association, past president of the Neurooptometric Rehabilitation Association, co-chair of the John Streff Invitational Lens Symposium, and trustee of the Vision Leads Foundation. Thank you so much again for being here. And without further ado, I will let you take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, so appreciate the invitation. Uh, first of all, uh, I am a, a consultant for NeuroLens. That's my only financial disclosure today. And all our financial uh, relationships have been mitigated. So today we're going to be speaking about prescribing for binocular vision disorders. So hopefully I can give you some nice little clinical pearls that you can provide your patients chair side in a shorter period of time so you don't have to take away valuable time from the examination. And we're going to get started here. Just to give you some ideas as how you can easily identify in your case histories uh, to find and start looking for individuals that may have undiagnosed binocular vision problems. So when a child comes in and they have frequent, or you see a child with frequent bumps on their face, and that is one indicator that potentially their binocular vision system is not adequate enough to judge when they're falling to catch themselves with their hands, and they often hit their face uh, frequently. So that is one case history point that will help us identify a potential binocular vision problem. So we start looking to be sure how they use their visual systems for um, eye teaming. Another one is extreme light sensitivity. When we have difficulties with suppression or binocular vision, it's really common to have extreme photosensitivity. And you'll see children closing one eye. Uh, the, the severe cases, uh, strabismus, an old term was called squint. And so when we start seeing that, again, we're going to identify that that's a potential cause for some binocular vision problems. So tonight we're, uh, we have about an hour, so we're going to try to cover a broad base of binocular vision conditions. Many of you are very familiar with these terms that you've heard probably when you're in the academic setting and later on. Each of these terms, uh, you can find uh, ICD-10 codes for diagnosis and be able to bill for these types of situations uh, under your medical code billing systems. So the four areas that we're gonna talk about this evening is to differentiate the difference between convergence excess, convergence insufficiency, divergence excess, and divergence insufficiency. So in general, uh, you can see that they'll have different types of uh, fork postures at different distances. So convergence excess, we're gonna see more ESO at near, insufficiency, more EXO at near, uh, divergence excess, more exo at far and divergence insufficiency, more ESO at near. So let's first talk about convergence excess. In my clinical experience, when we went through COVID, we came back from uh, staying out of practice for about six or seven weeks. And one marked change in our clinical assessments of a large percentage, about 70 to 75% of our patients, they showed an extreme increase in esophoria from the year before. So when we look at that, based on what we've seen over the years, when we see a, a shift toward esophoria, we're going to start thinking also about myopia. And sure enough, the following year, we had a lot of budding myopes, uh, more so than average. So the visual stress that they incurred and this excessive time on digitals really changed their, uh, their uh, 
dysphorias and increase their convergence excess tremendously. And now we do know there has been a term that they're saying that myopia is in epidemic uh, uh, proportions and is ex extremely increasing very quickly. Uh, and so this is uh, part of the contributing factor for that. So isoposture at near, so we see that more iso at near, and the norm uh, there is for four years when you're running it through your refractor, children and adults should be six exophoria through the lens they're using for near reading. When they're greater than exophoria, uh, then they're more convergent insufficient. When they're less than six exophoria, we're gonna start considering convergence excess. And so we start looking at that and identifying that condition and then uh, going further for our recommendations. So they'll get some near blur intermittently. Uh, they'll be holding their reading or cell phone very close, uh, probably within three or four inches, sometimes five or six inches. We prefer that it be about 16 inches. So that close target that they're using uh, is going to drive them to be higher levels of convergence excess and that excess continues to increase. Again, this is an indication that there's a potential for greater chance of increasing their myopia, and we have to start considering uh, treatment for that. They also can uh, exhibit some eye strain. So what are we gonna do prescription-wise for these convergence excess? So um, what we try to do is give them some plus at near and a small amount of yoked prism of base down micro prism. And we can also include a very narrow binasal occlusion in addition to that if they have extreme eye strain. At the end, for the end, I'm gonna show you how to decide how much of that to give. So you see a little example here, we have a little base down prism in front of each eye, and we have a little bit of plus on the bottom and their subjective correction on top. We don't wanna over plus them for distance because they won't wear them because everything's blur. So we do prescribe the distance prescription on top, uh, trying to keep it um, not over minus. We just want to keep it as close to their subjective without over minusing. So if they'll tolerate a little bit of less uh, subjective, a quarter less subjective and plus, we can try to push that, but we have to be a little cautious. And then we would give an ad for the bottom. Typically, we're giving about a 70, probably a one and a quarter ad for the dif difference between the top and bottom. So what we can also do in the foropter, we can measure the foria through the 0.75 ad and a 0.1 or 1.0 and a 1.2 ad, 2.5 ad. And what we're trying to do is get them back to close to six exophoria as possible. So we do chiroscopic tracings in our practice, and this gives us an indication as to whether uh, this person's posture is more ESO versus EXO. And in this situation, you can see uh, the diagram on the right. The two points of that star are uh, supposed to be coming to a point about, about uh, four, the little number four, you can see on the top barely. And that would be about an orthophoria for distance. We're seeing a little bit of esophoria there and some esophoria on the other. So we're trying to look at these tracings as we treat them with lenses. We're going to redraw these tracings and see if they can become more aligned where they're orthophoric. The next one we're going to talk about is divergence excess. So here we're gonna see more exo at distance. This is a tough case because they're not aware of the fact that they are diverging their eyes because they suppress and they do very rarely see double. And so it's a little bit more challenging to help those individuals resolve these conditions. So what we're gonna see with these individuals is when you're looking out at the distance, one of their eyes will turn out or they can alternate. They often have some poor depth perception, difficulties with ball catch, and problems with riding a bike. So the types of prescriptions we're going to think about here is we're going to start thinking about what can we do. You're seeing here is exo at distance, but we're going to give them a little plus at near because really the problems at distance. We might also include a little bit of base in prism or base up yoked. And the reason we do base up yoked is that brings them down and in uh, so that they can, um, their exo, they're up and out with their eyes. So prism, they're going up, away from that base. So the eyes will posture down and in. So that will have some advantage of decreasing the amount of divergence excess that they're experiencing. The other thing we're going to try one of two possibilities of um, 
occlusion. We do binasal occlusion. And I'm going to explain why binasals work for exo in just a moment. But we would do a binasal occlusion. And typically, uh, we're thinking of placing the edge of that binasal occlusion about one or two millimeters um, nasal to the limbus. So they're not encroaching the iris area. And they're not encroaching the pupil. The other option we have is doing something called a line awareness uh, type of occlusion. And what we do is the eye that deviates, we cover the other eye. And when they're looking straight ahead, we take a, a, a very thin strip of scotch tape and we place it at about halfway between the pupil edge and the iris edge of that eye that's going to deviate. So every time the eye deviates out, it's going to see that little bit of blur. And that gives them some feedback that that eye is turning because they're, they don't get a double vision feedback. So we want to give them that, that feedback to start them to learn what it feels like when the eye is deviating and when the eye is aligned. And so that's one nice technique we've used with great success. The next one is divergence insufficiency. These individuals are more ESO at distance. Now we don't see this as often in our younger populations, but where I do see this is our adult populations. And what happens as the individuals are in their 70s, 80s, uh, the connective tissue, tissue to the extracular muscles can potentially be weakened. And so what they found is that when the adult has, starts having some issues with the, the, the connective tissue, when they look at distance, their eyes cannot align well and it's mostly the um, the medial recti that are not holding them in alignment at ortho, they'll start over converging and they'll have that divergence insufficiency. And they, these individuals will often report um, double vision when they're driving and looking at distance. Uh, also, these individuals are gonna be um, turning their eyes inward. Uh, they uh, have some blur, sometimes headaches, Poor depth perception, difficulty parking their car, the barrels and nighttime driving are very difficult for them as well. And they also can exhibit some motion sickness and also uh, photosensitivity. So now we're gonna talk about divergence insufficiency. In this situation with this ESO, we're, this is one case that we're gonna start trying the base down prism for application, and we can go up to about a two prism doctor base down. So it'll be a little bit more aggressive with the amount of base down prism we're gonna use. We're gonna use a full plus prescription uh, at distance. And obviously if they're full presbyops, they're gonna get a full plus at near. We also very, very narrow binasals. The nat binasals on these cases are gonna be at the medial canthus and um, not encroaching the uh, part of the palpi, the bulbar conjunctiva area, but it's gonna be right at that medial canthus. If we have an adult that has constant ESO at distance, we are gonna sometimes also potentially prescribe instead of the base down, a base out prism, one, two, or potentially three each eye to offset that, uh, that um, divergence is sufficiency. So these individuals will have uh, poor fusion at distance and extreme ESO, and you can see how they're almost touching on these two points here. And so they have a lot of uh, inability to control that the eyes at distance. So the next one we're gonna talk about is convergence insufficiency. And this situation, very common with anyone that sustained a concussion, or traumatic brain injury, something like that. Also, our very older populations, you're going to start seeing convergence insufficiency in increased numbers. These individuals are going to experience eye strain, double vision at near, blurred vision, headaches, poor attention, and eye strain. So what we're going to do with these cases is we're going to apply a, a micro basin prism, which is about a 0.25 each eye or a 0.5, depending upon what we're doing. We also are using a commonly contoured prism with these cases with great success. 
Most of the prism that we're using for contour is two diopters or less bilaterally. So it'll be split between the two eyes and it's a 0.75 difference between the distance and near. We also actually are using a low plus lens for these cases, which again, these are exo patients, but you can put a little low plus and I'll show you why that is in a moment because we're expanding that space based on where their targets are placed and the virtual image is actually larger. A binasal occluder will also allow them to adapt well to these types of contoured lenses in addition to the, the type of lens we're prescribing. Again, we would be prescribing a bifocal because we're giving a different lens at distance than we are at near. And the binasals for this case would be about one millimeter nasal to the limbus. The exophoria is going to look like this. So that ortho line I mentioned earlier, the points of those stars are going to be further apart than that ortho line. The one nice thing about this test is we have that done in our pre-testing and we can look at this. It's like an x-ray of how they posture their eyes before we enter the examination room so we know kind of what we're going to be looking for. for. So now let's go after we talk about those four cases, how we determine and how we come up with the different types of lens prescribing. So we have lenses as options, we have prisms, and we have occlusion. So with lenses, we do try to get the most symmetrical two lenses possible between the two eyes. And the reason we do that is we're trying to get the size as equal as possible on the XYZ axis that they're projecting out into the to what they're looking at. With prisms, we try to use micro prisms and make suggestions of, of helping the eye deviating instead of doing it all for them. And then we often use a binasal occluder, occluder to help them with the alignment and adaptation to the lens prescribing that we're using therapeutically. So we have specific goals for our lens prescribing. They can have a wide variety of glows or just one, and sometimes not the exact same prescription as good for each of these goals. And so it's not uncommon to have different prescriptions based on what we want to achieve. So we're looking at number one, do we need to pr improve performance of reading, close work at near uh, and function? And this is when the vision works well, it's gonna guide the rest of the system to, to be efficient. What about productivity? Are they efficient learners in a short period of time? Can they read quicker or are they slow? Are they having a problem time keeping focus for any length of time? Change of behavior. Sometimes kids are very frustrated and it's difficult for them to keep their eyes focused when reading. So it becomes more of a behavior type of application. We also can think about improving the function. Easier to achieve the automaticity when the eyes are functioning smoothly. I think of the two visual systems as visual circuits. Each eye is passing that circuit electrical photon information over to the brain and firing at the exact same time. And we wanna get lenses and prisms that allow them to do it with ease. And then finally, guiding development. When vision guides the right way, it's gonna help them develop better visual skills. There's over 40 visual skills for learning. Life and business. One is 2020, but the rest of the 39 is are as are important. And the, the right lens can guide these different visual skills so they can learn to judge the space around them precisely and accurately. So when we're thinking of lenses, it's okay to think of them in two different ways. So we're going to think of compensatory lens and a therapeutic lens or a combination of both. An example of a compensatory lens would be if you're a nearsighted person, you have two doctors in myopia, and when you put a two doctor minus lens on, you see clearly at distance. If you take the glasses off, you do not. That minus two lens compensates your myopia so that you can see clearly. When we apply a plus lens, for example, or let's say we apply um, a low plus lens and it magnifies the near, and all of a sudden their eyes are more comfortable with less eye strain. They use that plus lens for a period of time and the eyes beginning to learn to do that, to process that information. And then when they pick up reading without the lenses, they can still have some of the benefit because of the changes of how the eyes organize that visual information lasts. That now becomes a definition of a therapeutic lens. It's used to therapeutically change how those visual systems are functioning. 
But sometimes we have a combination. We have a nearsighted person with a binocular vision problems. We have to use some of the micro prisms, different plus lenses. And so we have a little bit of a combination of both potential possibilities. So why do we put plus lenses on XO patients? It kind of goes against some of the things we may have learned in school, uh, but if we look at the optics of the lens, it can show you why a very low powered plus lens can benefit the patient because it changes the size of the image. So a low plus lens with a focal point at a certain distance, if you put an object within that focal point, it actually creates a virtual image that's larger and further away. That larger and further away is easier to process visually. The, when you have the right plus lens in front of the patient when they're reading, they will remark that the print looks bigger and blacker. If that's the response, you know that lens is gonna allow that process to be more efficient. And uh, many of you have taken ophthalmic optics way back when. And, uh, and so all lenses that we prescribe each hair side have front and back surfaces. We're very familiar with that. But remember, when we have those front and back surfaces, we're gonna be creating prismatic effects on those lenses. So remarkably, when we put a lens in from a patient, some of us are, know they come back and they're distorted. Well, we know that because when they look at a grid that's the right size and shape, but we put a lens in front of them, it's going to distort the image. But our brain is pretty remarkable. It will change how we're looking at that image and do the opposite. So it sees the curve, but it knows it's straight. And so now we have to change in our mind how that looks. We're projecting opposite to how we're perceiving it so that we can look at it so that it's accurately judged as perfectly square. This works fantastic most of the time until you have an eye strain, trauma, stress on the, the brain, which cause the visual system to be stressed. And this good conversion of projection and perception begins to be misrepresented and misjudged. And so therefore now they're getting a lot of distortion. So those are things we consider when prescribing lenses and prisms. So the power of the lens away from that optical center is not the same as it is in the optical center. And as you can see, the base of this optical uh, ophthalmic lens on the left is showing you that the size and shape of those little squares that we're seeing are different when the image is pushed through the base versus the apex of the lens. This is a combination of a, of a lens and um, a prism. Now let's talk a little bit about suppression. When we're judging how significant those four conditions were when they come into our practice, divergence, excess, insufficiency, convergence, excess, insufficiency, now we also must make a decision. How significant is the suppression? Is it mild, strong, or no suppression at all? So mild suppression actually becomes more confusion for those that are trying to learn academic information, reading, writing, math, because sometimes they suppress, sometimes they don't, and the two visual systems are in conflict with each other more significantly. Now, if I have a strong suppression and I can shut one eye down, it's not as problematic because I don't have as much confusion. And yet we have a strong suppression often associated with in, uh, either, and can be amblyopia most often, but also abnormal correspondence can occur, or it can just shut it off like a divergence excess, may not have amblyopia, uh, but they still suppress, don't know that their eye is turning away. Usually when we see diplopia with a strabism or with one of those four conditions, if it's a recent onset, we have to look at any type of trauma that's occurred. But if not, then we're going to start searching for potential lesions neurologically and obviously consult with neuro neuro a neurologist. So and with prescribing, again, we're going to think about lenses, prisms, and occlusion. So 
about prisons. We talked about lenses just now. Same thing with prisons. We can compensate with prisons, and that is neutralizing the deviation 100% of the prismatic deviation. Therapeutically would be those micro prisons we like to use. Uh, the contour prisms would fall in the th therapeutic as we're doing a little bit of, of the uh, compensating of the deviation, but not fully compensating, teaching the brain how to do some of it on their own. So when you remove those prisms, remove them from the patient for therapeutic purposes, the eye foria or deviation will have changed and reduced. And again, that's why it's important to monitor that every year. I do have several cases that I prescribed. Uh, 0.25 base in, and over time, they start going less exo, and now we have to consider, do we need that much? Do we need to make that a change? Same with base down. It actually um, is for the ESOs, base down yoked, and over time, if they start going exo, we need to remove that one and start thinking about the base in. Depends upon how flexible those systems are. Some will hold, some will not. So the ophthalmic optics of prisms is characterized by having a non-uniform deviation of light rays. And that was a statement made by Ron Jones from Ohio State. So we see again, the linear perspective here, the asymmetrical magnification, there's curvature of lines that are perpendicular to the base apex. There's rotation of lines parallel to the base apex. And these are base curve dependent. So if you remember the linear perspective information that we, we are seeing all the time with our visual systems. So if we look at these trees and we're thinking about going down the road, we know the trees are all the same size, but yet if we look at it, we see that they're getting smaller. So again, our brain has to convert the information and actually see the trees that are further away as bigger in order to judge them as equal. Now, if you look through prisms, uh, accurately through three dimensions, you'll get those silo effects, small in, large out types effects. But if you only look at it as a flat surface, then what you're going to do is you're going to get a different perspective of when you're looking through the base versus the apex of the prism. So if you look at the target on the bottom, if it's a flat surface, the little lines get closer and are more compressed and they're smaller. However, if you can visually look at the FP and push it way far away, you can slowly push it away and make it look as if all of these lines are the equal distance apart. So there's two ways the visual systems we're assessing, assessing could potentially look through these ophthalmic lenses and prisms that we're prescribing. Our job is to judge how they're doing this and whether and try to guide them to do it on a three-dimensional way versus a two-dimensional. And we do that with a lot of visual motor activities reinforced by kinesthetic reaching and touching. And the reason we do that is because we have to change how the eyes judge where things are on the X, Y, Z axis. So what prisms do is not only do they shift, we recall the Prentice rule where um, it, depending on the amount of prism, it's gonna shift it uh, away from the base toward the apex. But not only does it shift it away from the base, but it also brings it closer on the Z axis and it rotates the X axis so that the it actually expands away from the base and pulls toward the apex. So it's a big rotation of those X, Y, Z axis like we saw on the grid just a moment ago. So here's a quick summary of if I'm going to consider prescribing for different conditions of binocular problems. I'm going to think if they're exophoric or tropic, I'm going to start thinking of two types of potential prism applications. We're going to potentially do a basin prism, usually a minimal amount. So if they're the convergence insufficiency, we're thinking about 0 0.25, 0 0.5, if it's a contoured prism, we're thinking... Um, anywhere up to 2.0, from 0 to 2.0, which is different from distance to near. The other potential is a base up, which is gonna bring them down and in. Sometimes your divergence excess will be better served by the base up prism versus the base in. And what we do is we check about how much they can be aware of their binocular visual system, 
How good is their physiologic diplopia with these two applications? Um, where do they see single? Where do they see double? Does the deviation decrease the distance from them based on base up versus base in? Our go-to is typically base in, but we do have some that respond better to the base up. When we're doing ESO, our preference is base down. The reason we tend to lean away from the base out most of the time is it tends to shut down your peripheral, bringing it in and tunnel visioning with tunneling it down. And we really do better with binocularity if we can process visual information on both eyes and open up the whole visual ambient uh, peripheral process. It allows us to have better fusion abilities. However, the ones we don't, we usually are considering base out for those individuals with the double vision at distance due to the esotropia that they're experiencing. And typically those are adult onset cases for the most part. You can get a paradoxical response. You can get esos to respond better to base in. And it's kind of remarkable over the last three years, we've been using some contoured prism and we do have some esos that feel better through um, the base in. And so by applying it, our theory is, is that they actually are naturally more exo, but they are performers. So they pull their eyes in constantly. And so they end up being eso because they pull too far. When we give the base in, it gives a little bit of that exo pulling need, and they actually realign and are more comfortable. And again, we tell Test that chair side to see if they get a better visual motor. What do I mean by visual motor response? Visual motor response would be if I've done um, an NPC, a pursuits, and a cover test. So I look and see if their eyes are more smoothly functioning while they're following a target with different types of applications. In addition to that, we would do dynamic book retinoscopy at near. And again, this is an hour presentation, so we don't have time to go through everything, but we'd confirm which of these are gonna give the best reflex when they're processing that visual information. Base down yoked prism can also use for mobility and ESO posture. So mobility would be sometimes individuals with base down versus base up can have better ability to walk and balance as they're walking down the hallway. Anterior egocentric shift and increases in experience of superior visual space. So based down will give individuals that are ignoring that superior space more ability to use it and function better in that space. Base up is gonna bring you down and in. So exoposture, uh, mobility, different mobility situations uh, depending upon how they're walking. Posture egocentric shift, which means that they would be leaning, um, they would be leaning backwards. Their ego center would be above the line of sight where the others would be anterior is below the line of sight. And also the base up would show increases in experience of the inferior space. So those that have really poor inferior space organization, which is measured by different techniques, uh, chair side, astral visual motor, uh, hand-eye coordination activities, um, handwriting would be an example of seeing a, a history point that would have some difficulties. So maybe a base up would give them better experience of that space so they can function and guide their hand with their eyes more efficiently. We apply vertical prisms for diplopia. A lot of uh, fourth nerve palsies that uh, have constant double vision will receive some vertical deviations, hypertropias. Once in a while, hyperphoria depends upon whether we have the opportunity to try to train it out with some visual motor, vi optometric vision therapy activities, or if not, we'd be applying them chair side to the prescription. And then dissociated activities, we do a lot of dissociative activities to uh, improve the visual motor accommodation systems and anti-suppression activities to make those two visual circuits function equally on the XYZ axis and have good orientation organization as they process those information uh, individually so that they have better ability to combine the information and have enhanced binocularity. Uh, lateral base out, again, we would use those for the ESO postures at distance, mostly our adult ones. Once in a while, we have constant esotropes. Kids acquire it uh, for disease. Um, we had a child with a surgery that had tonsillectomy and had bilateral 
esotropia after the surgery, we did apply base out while we were treating the case. Uh, and then later on, we're able to remove it. And then lateral base in, exoposture, and near comfort. Uh, again, it's a probably the most common prism overall. I would say of all prisms prescribed for the normal populations, probably considered probably 80% of the time, if not a little more. So we do use the line bifocal more preferably than the, the progressive for some of the cases that require uh, different function distance and near. Um, the newly designed contoured prism does come with a progressive, which is easier to tolerate and gives better um, movement. The line bifocal helps them be aware of the line. So it's increasing the, the visual awareness of shifting from distance to near and near to far, and that can be advantageous. So here we have prescribing options. Again, we're thinking, don't forget, we're trying to uh, get the right lens, the right prism. And now what we're going to do is talk about binasal occluders. So one thing we found is that occlusion can be very helpful to help individuals adapt well to different types of lens prescribing, plus improve binocularity. I'm going to talk tonight mostly on the binasal occlusions. And the reason the binasal occluders help improve binocularity is because they remove the confusion of the crossed fibers. We know the right eye sees the visual field on the right from the temporal, old crosses over and goes about a third of the, six or seven inches to the left of the midline. And then the left eye sees from the left side all the way across to uh, partway to the right side. If you look at the fields below, we see the green areas where the two fields cross. When the visual systems aren't functioning well, the eyes are either pointed too far out, too far in. So if the eyes are too far out, they have less cross, but it's still confusing to the brain. If they're too far in, the ESOs, you have more cross. That's why we use less for ESO and more for EXO. But when we take away that cross fibers, we can process information more easily because we don't have two pieces of information going in from the same visual space and when the eyes are aligned well, it's not a problem. It's when they're misaligned, that misinformation coming back around in from the same area in space causes confusion, hence the light sensitivity, hence the squinting of one eye, eye strain, difficulty, um, dizziness, vertigo, all those types of conditions are common when they cannot organize that visual space. Here's an example of what I was saying earlier. The red line indicates approximately where we would place the ESO uh, binasal occlusion versus the blue line is the EXO. The EXO would be uh, placed about one to two millimeters uh, nasal to the limbus. And uh, we found, we try to give the least amount we need, but we found that this is pretty consistent with these two types of conditions. These would look like this. We apply them typically with a, um, a, a nail polish on the inside of the lens or scotch tape. Nail polish is less obvious, so sometimes cosmetically more acceptable. Uh, some people do need a little more dense tape. Obviously, it's not as pleasant to wear it. And uh, so we do uh, do that uh, as much as we can if we need to, but we prefer to do uh, as, as less as we can, so it's cosmetically acceptable and they'll wear it for more periods of time. For the contoured prism, sometimes we have an individual that isn't used to the slight distortion that occurs with those. And so we can add binasals, they begin to accept it, and then they get some relief of their symptoms of dizziness, headaches, eye strain, um, neck and shoulder pain. So that's been very beneficial to help uh, individuals be able to adapt to the therapeutic part of the lens that we're trying to help treat their binocular vision system with. So patients with high prescriptions, I prefer to uh, get them in a contact lens if I can. And I think that we are very aggressive in putting contact lens on as soon as we can a, long, a younger child. Um, we have four-year-olds that actually can put the contacts on themselves and do very well with that. I often tell parents that 
Um, it's much easier to teach a 10 year old how to take good care of their contacts than a 13 year old because they don't always want to listen to us. So there actually research has shown that you do not get increased infections uh, in children versus adults percentage wise. And again, getting good hygiene habits early on and training them the right way is really the key to health good success. And then once we get that high prescription in the lenses, then we're uh, more likely to put a, a low plus lens over the top in a prescriptive form. So a non-prescriptive uh, contoured lens and or a, a low plus lens with some micro prisms are some potentials for applications because we know that if we just lower um, the minus lens and the eyeglass prescription, we're not getting the magnification that we could with a low plus lens because just cutting the lens like a minus 350 to a minus three uh, doesn't have a focal point change difference than we do from a, a plano to a plus 50. So the difference between the two focal points is much greater. And so that's why it's more uh, beneficial to get a low plus lens over the top of contacts because it is a better magnifier. You can also add a mild uh, blue blocker on that uh, for computer uses and things like that, which is helpful as well. And we can apply our binasals as needed. So the computer RX, um, we're trying now a couple of considerations. We know now that when we put those computers right in front of us, that's exactly where we wanna to look to look at distance. So now we actually need a second pair if they're gonna be spending several hours or more on a computer. And so in these situations, it's a little bit uh, different. We want to have good vision straight ahead at about 50 to 60 centimeters. And we want to prescribe for that distance. And so we'll be changing to a set of lenses that's appropriate for the computer work. Otherwise, we're going to have poor head positioning and um, some confusion and utilization of different lenses incorrectly if we don't understand where they're actually looking at when they're looking at that computer. And again, the coatings that we would add to that for protection forms um, would be applied. Okay, so um, the least amount of prism is what we wanna go for. And we need that to create the desired change. We know small amounts of prisms have less dependency. So the one thing is when applying these lenses and prisms, uh, we do try to give the smallest amount possible rather than doing it all for that patient. And so micro prisms, again, uh, 0.25 all the way up. Two diopters is probably my, my maximum, is my definition of micro prisms. If I have to go to a larger prism, 5, 10, 15, 20, those are more my, my patients with brain injury, muscle paralysis, those types. But most of the individuals that are younger, that we're applying for these four conditions are the micro prisms. Again, a 0.25 base in uh, and a point, uh, once in a while 0.5 for application. And then um, the uh, amount of plus lenses, usually a plus 62 or less. If I can, the high um, ESOs, we might go up to a one and a quarter add for the difference between the distance and near. Applying the binasal occluders, right at the limbus for the exos and the medial canthus for the esos. 